Good evening, Berean. As we welcome those who are joining us online as well. <clears throat> Tonight, as we gather together again around the Word of God, we uh, turn to Holy Scripture and ask God to lead and guide us in his exhortation of our lives. This morning, we reached a important juncture in the book of Acts. We arrived at the second progress report. As I made mention of you, as I made mention when I began this series, <clears throat> Luke has a series of progress reports where he stops for a moment and gives an update to the reader as they follow along in the story of the book of Acts. And so this morning we had, we had the, uh, the pleasure of looking at the second progress report, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Now, uh, as I said when we, when we looked at the first progress, re progress report, our intention when we, when we arrive at these junctures in the Bible is to stop, make sure we understand what the progress report is saying, and then after we understand what it's saying, going to do a, uh, a review of what the, the progress report summarized. So the, so the progress report is summarizing for us what Luke has said up to that point from the previous progress report. And so that was our goal this morning. So this, this morning, sir, the morning's message was effectively divided into two parts. The first part was understanding the progress report itself. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, Luke says, And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the, the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And so it's, cl it's clear as you read this verse that Luke is making three statements about the church up to that point. And these three statements each paint a different picture uh, but a related picture to what's going on in the church. Each of, these, each of these pictures tell us the church was growing, but they tell us the church was growing in different ways. First off, uh, the first thing that Luke, Luke did was paint a picture of the faithfulness of the church to its mission. The faithfulness of the church to its mission. And uh, he said that, that the word of God kept spreading. So the first thing we did was <clears throat> we defined the phrase word of God. What does Luke mean when he uses the phrase? This, <clears throat> this might, uh, I don't know if this um, was a surprise to you this morning, but I indicated to you that Luke uses this phrase the most in the New Testament. In fact, Acts uses it more than any other book in the New Testament, the phrase the word of God. And so what does Luke mean when he says the word of God? Well, there's two options, we said. Either he means the, the uh the gospel, that's one meaning of the word of God. And the second one is the Bible itself in general. And so we looked at both of those. We looked at the word of God as the gospel. And Acts has a number of those uses. We looked at um, Acts chapter 13, for example. But also it has the meaning of the Bible itself. And so we looked at that uh, from uh, Acts 18, Acts chapter 20 as well. And so the conclusion we made was that the phrase word of God in ver chapter four, 6 verse 7 is referring to the entire Bible, the Bible that of course they had at that time. So what, so that was spreading, that was spreading. What did he mean by spreading? Two things we concluded. One was that the direct influence of Bible teaching on the community in Jerusalem, there was a, there was a direct impact on the, uh, the, the teaching of Holy Scripture that was taking place in the Jerusalem Fellowship. The second thing he meant was that the, the, the Word of God being taught to the church impacted the sheep, and the sheep were then impacting their friends, their family, their co-laborers, their classmates, that, that, uh, that, that they were in fact influencing others because the Word of God was influencing them. And so, we saw here then the first, the first part of the progress report, the faithfulness of the church to its mission. Number two was the impact of the mission on the population. What was taking place? Well, we, the second statement he makes was that there was a, that the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And here we saw that, obviously, early in the book of Acts, Luke is giving you some pretty huge numbers. 2,000 get saved. 
on the, the day of Pentecost. 5,000 males get saved in Acts chapter 4, and not, not including the females and the children. Probably about 20,000 people got saved. And then even when he drops the, the, uh, the numbers, he still talks about the multitude of believers. It just, there's, there's, a, the, there's an inundation of people that are coming into the church at this time. And so we looked at that. We looked at, 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 at the idea that <clears throat> he says that they were increasing greatly. Um, this, is, this is something that God is doing. It's something that is continuously taking place. He defines it as in Jerusalem because, of course, that's where the emphasis is. It, it, it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to realize here that the, the church hasn't moved beyond Jerusalem yet. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on, and we, we kind of just keep reading Acts and don't realize, oh, man, they're still in Jerusalem. And they don't really leave Jerusalem until Acts chapter 8. And so uh, all, of, all of these people getting saved are, are getting saved in, in, in the vicinity of the holy city itself or, or those who are coming into the holy city from the outskirts. And that led to the third point that Luke made, which was the extent of the mission's impact. How extensive was this impact? A bunch of priests were getting saved. That's the crazy part. The priests, the most, most committed people to the Mosaic covenant were themselves abandoning Judaism for Christianity. And Luke tries to draw Theophilus's attention to this statement. He, he has two points right up front. A great many, a great many. Uh, this, these are the words right up front in, the, in this clause which serve as, as a place of emphasis where um, Luke is trying to draw the reader to understand this is a, this is a, 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 a very powerful reality. Uh, Priests were abandoning Judaism. I said this morning we had a second exodus. <laughs> uh, the, the exodus of the, of the priests from Judaism. Judaism clearly had, had run its course. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the priests realized that Jesus is the end of the law. He fulfills the law. And so they were turning from the, from the law to its fulfillment, Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I, I gave you a little... Um, a little aside this morning uh, to talk about why, why all these priests? What, what, what's going on with all these priests? Well, uh, just kind of quickly to, to, to uh, review from, from the morning's message, each week took 700 priests to run the temple. So 700 priests were active every week to run the temple. There were 24 cycles of priests that ran the temple. That's approximately 16,800 priests in minimum. Historians tell us there were, there were over 20,000 priests that lived in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Okay, not in Jerusalem, but, but in the surrounding region. Acts 5 tells us that there were multitudes of people coming from the countryside into Jerusalem to be healed by the church. Uh, I argued that a lot of those people coming into Jerusalem were, would have been priests or related to priests because they really uh, consumed most of the, the, uh, the living in this region, uh, the, the families of priests. And so, uh, in fact, of course, you know, John the Baptist, where, where, where did John the Baptist come from? The hill country of Judea. Why? Well, because his father was a priest and he had to go back and forth to the temple to work. Um, and so that was the progress report itself, and I, what it meant. Then what I did was I reviewed for you Acts chapter 3, verse 1, through Acts chapter 6, verse 6. This is the section that this progress report is summarizing. It summarizes chapter 3, verse 1. I'm sorry. Yeah, chapter 3, verse 1, through to... Um, through to chapter uh, 6, verse 6. <clears throat> three things that, uh, well, sorry, uh, three things, five things that we looked at here. Uh, in this, in the first part of this uh, section, Luke focuses on the opposition that the church was facing. The, the church was facing some serious opposition. And so what I did this morning was I summarized the five events, the five events that Luke recorded in this uh, a section 
to give you an illustration of the opposition that the church overcame. The, the, the church overcame government oppression. The church overcame hardship. The church overcame transgression. The, the church overcame oppression a second time. And then the church, most recently in our study, Acts chapter 6, overcame misunderstanding. And so I summarized for you basically stuff you'd already heard, but I summarized for you what the church had overcome in those five events. And this, is, this of course, was a powerful witness uh, to us of the fact that Jesus would build his church and nothing could stop it. And we see, uh, we see some bold examples of that in uh, Acts 3, verse 1 through Acts 6, verse 6. Any questions on the morning's message? Yes. Could you d differentiate uh, the priests versus chief priests in the 700? Because the chief priests were involved in the conspiracy that, you know, the disciples stole away the body and they you know, paid the uh, gods to, you know, lie for them. And then earlier on in Acts, again, they, they, there's their severe opposition, but here you see the priests yeah. coming. So what's sort of the power dynamic between the priests? Well, that's a good question. What's the power um, a dynamic? regarding the priests in Judaism at this time. Well, when, we, when, we, when you hear the word priest, unless the Bible defines it, um, it's difficult to really know who he's talking about. And let me say, this. so we have the high priest. Normally in Jewish history, this would be one person for a lifetime. But of course, that stopped. Herod appointed a high priest every single year. And so they rotated. Uh, they were, in fact, at one time in the Gospels, you got four high priests alive at the same time. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and so, um, but, but, but the Jews really recognized one person. Al although there was one person called the high priest, they was, it was mostly the senior person that they would have recognized to actually be the high priest. So the high, high priest, and this was a small group of people. Then there was the, the chief priest. This was a um, group of uh, recognized priests. Uh, they would have been considered the upper echelon of the priestly, of, of the priestly caste. Then you had the priests Okay, that was, this is, an example would be John the Baptist's father was a priest, Zechariah. And then you had, I always get the spelling of this wrong, is that right? That's wrong, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about. The Sadducees, uh, what is it, a two Ds? The, uh, the Sadducees, they were also priests. Um... <clears throat> It's, it's hard to define who these people were, to be honest, because while we recognize that they were priests, we, we don't, oftentimes we, we contrast them or compare them with Pharisees. But the, the, the Pharisaical, uh, the, the, the Pharisees were a, um, a more, I don't want to say hardened group, but they were a more um, definable group of people with a distinct history and a distinct awareness of how you became one. Uh, so, but uh, those, are, those are the four big uh, ideas when you think of priests. Who are these people? The high priest, a small, a small group of people that would have fulfilled the office that once a year they go into the Holy Holies, that type of thing. And then the, the chief priest, priests and Sadducees. Any other questions on the morning? Yes. So you're saying the last, the last two are probably the ones where the conversion was happening? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. It, it, thank, yes. So, so I would probably put the conversion actually in this group more than the Sadducees. Uh, the Sadducees made up a large portion of the Sanhedrin, and they were a pretty hardened group. Priests priest didn't serve on the Sanhedrin except through the auspices of the Sadducees. So I would put most of the people who were getting saved in, the, in this group here. Mm -hmm. 
they weren't elected. And so um, Herod, Herod appointed the high priest. And it was more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Political than anything else. Yes. So, um, two questions. To kind of get, you know, you say there probably was 20,000 priests. It's hard to know how do you compare that with the whole population? You know, is this a, a significant number or a small number? Well, of that time? let's say the. Let's say you argue that the population of Jerusalem is 50,000 people, maybe, maybe 60. That's what historians say? Estimate. You know, uh, dur during the feast, maybe it went up to 100,000, maybe. Uh, people coming in. Yeah. So if it's, if it's 50 or 60,000 people, then 20,000 people is a lot of folks. But again, they're not living in Jerusalem. Right. They're, they're, they're living in, in the outskirts, and then they're coming in for the week of service that they have. I'm sure some of them lived in Jerusalem, but, but, but the vast majority of them would have lived outside the city. But they would still be living in that area where, when we think of the Old Testament, where... where Judea. Judea. Yeah. Just Judea? Which, or? of course, Jerusalem is in right. Judea. So, uh, the hill country okay. around, around uh, Jerusalem. But like where all the tribes were. Or that's too much. That's too big. So, that if area. you think of the tribes as... Um, Judea is the southern, the southern tribes. Okay, if, you, if, you come in, if, you come this, if you're coming from this from the Old Testament, uh -huh. it'd be Israel in the north, which is, uh, which, which is the, the, uh, the ten tribes. In the south would be um, 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 Benjamin. Benjamin and Judah. Judah. And it's called Judea. But, but um, so if, if, you, if you have an Old Testament mindset, then it would be in the southern, in the southern, where the southern tribes were, and Jerusalem would be in the hill country of Judea, but Judea would be bigger than just Jerusalem. I, I'm not sure what the question that you're asking. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what the, what the area was, you know, like where, how much this encompassed, to be able to, in your mind, like, if you only say 50 or 60,000 people, then that, that's a lot of people. Oh, it is. had to... It's one, it's, it would have been probably the largest city in Israel. Right. And so, so my other question is, so based on the, my understanding of the Old Testament, you know, was all of this stuff, so when you're calling priest, would that be like the Levites in the Old Testament as far as everybody who worked the tabernacle and the temple at David and Solomon's time? Okay, or, so, so how, or when did this change that there's so many of them? Or was this always the case? That, was there always this many people having to work the temple work? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so, um, so when you talk about the, the uh, tabernacle slash... Temple. You're talking about a uh, division of labor. And so it's broken up into the uh, Levites and the um, ironic priesthood. Of course, Aaron was a Levite, but so his family was, was chosen out of the Levites, and so you had to be a descendant of Aaron to be a priest. Levites assisted the priests. Assisted the priests in their duties. When, I, when I'm talking about the 700, I'm talking about 700 priests. Every priest was a Levite, but I'm not talking about the Levites, just the priests. It took 700 priests to run the temple. For example... This is, in Her this is in Herod's time. That yeah. wasn't not the case in the Old Testament. I mean, David, David is the one who did this. He's, he's, he's the one who, who broke up 
the, organized the, the worship of, of, a, of the temple along these lines. So this is from the, from the time of David. So, so uh, what I was concerned was that the word priests now kind of meant Levi's, the people who supported the temple work, you know, carrying it and doing other things, no. but not, but you're just saying priest is only priest, is just that. Ironic people. priesthood. Just let me give you let me give you one example. Uh, now, <laughs> of course, not every day was was uh, a Passover, but j j just think of the national feast. So three times a year you got to go, um, and so you have probably hundreds of thousands of people coming to sacrifice. Well, you, you can't have one or two priests doing that. I mean, you're, you're, having to, you're having to kill a whole lot of animals. And, 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 and we kind of have to, and something else that we, we need to kind of keep in mind is um, this wasn't like, I, they didn't have our view of church. So in, in our view of church, how often do you come to church a week? For I'm gonna talk. I'm not talking about for meetings uh, or for. Uh, I'm talking about how many times you come to church for service. Once a week, maybe. If you're really stretching it, when we used to have service on Wednesday, you, you came Monday and Wednesday. Okay. So uh, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, we had a youth meeting on Friday. So I, I was in church three days a week for services. I was in church three other days a week for practices. So I was at church six days a week, it seemed like. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> but normatively, you, you're at church two or three times a week uh, for services. How many times was the temple open f for our service a week? Every day. And how, how, many, how, how many times a day did they worship at least? You were going to say it, was it? Seven. Uh, excuse me? At least what? Five. At least two. What, 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 what was the minimum? Two. Would, be the, would be the morning sacrifices and the evening sacrifices. Minimum. Minimum. Okay. There's all, the sacrifices going out, going out <laughs> almost throughout the whole day. So this, this, is, this is not our perspective on worship. You know, we, we, don't, we don't worship the way the Jews worship. Which was, in, which was if, if you lived in Jerusalem and you didn't go to, go to the temple once a day, that was weird. I mean, they're going to pray, they're going to sacrifice, they're going to do offerings. I mean, this is, this is every day. Your life is rotating around worship. That's, that's how they live life. We don't rotate around worship. And so uh, we think, man, what are these, what are, what are 700 pastors doing there? I mean, they're just twiddling their thumbs. Well, no, they're not. They're, these people are, are active, working, uh, and uh, because worship is ongoing there, morning, noon, and night. And so. Well, it's just you know when you read what happens in um, at the tabernacle, there's one priest, just one high priest. One oh, okay, one high priest. <laughs> but then all the the children of Aaron would have been called priests too. Not all of them, because it was it was one family. It was it was one of Aaron's children, basically, who were who were the priests. But okay, so, but I'm saying too, at that time, the best guess. I mean, there were millions of Jews. Yeah. And so I'm just thinking, they didn't have 700 priests back then. No, no, the no, they, no. There, there weren't 700 priests, and 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 of course the the uh, the the tabernacle moved around. And the, uh, so not everybody had, not everybody, so it wasn't an everyday thing for everybody in the, for a large group of people, depending on where, where the tabernacle was. When David brought, when, when David brought the tabernacle to Jerusalem, and then eventually Solomon, Solomon built, built the, 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 uh, the, the temple, David reorganizes the priesthood completely. He does a complete revamp. Um, you're an Old Testament expert. I just read it. Uh, is it, it's, 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 it's in, it's, I believe it's in, is it in Chronicles? It's in Chronicles. Yeah, I believe it's in, in, in Chronicles. Chronicles. Okay. And, and it's really, it's really, it, I don't know about you, but it's shocking to me 
there's some stuff there that it's, you wonder why. Yeah, it's shocking to me. And the reason, you know, you know, he's not just, he's just not coming up with something where there wasn't prescription already. So there's already, there's already the Bible describing what's supposed to happen. Well, David just revamps the whole thing. And it's okay with God. Okay, that, that's incredible to me. And so there's some implications. When I did my series on the, on the, the law years ago, I dealt with uh, one, of the, one of the key things that I argued was, you know, if, if you're going to argue that, that the law couldn't be altered, you have a hard time dealing with what David's doing. Because David is completely altering the prescription for the priests and how they function in reference to the temple. So that's just a thought. But yeah, it, it's when as you read through the Old Testament, you'll, you'll, you'll come across this major section where David is, re, is revamping how, how the priests work and uh, dividing them into orders and having, them, and having their ministry uh, laid out in that fashion. But we could, we could say, can we say with certainty that all of these priests here in the passage in Acts would have been a descendant of Levi? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they would have been able to prove it. And so now, of course, this, this changes, of course, in, in, in 70 AD. Uh, so nobody in, in 70 AD, the uh, temple is destroyed. All the records are gone. And so no one knows who's who. Unless your last name's Carl. <laughs> Ignore that statement from the, from the associate pastor. Any, 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 any other questions from the morning's message? Yes. They couldn't. They wouldn't just pass that down orally, like once the. That might work for a while, but y y you aren't going to get. You aren't going to. You aren't going to be able to keep that many people. Straight. That straight. I mean, it's just not. It's just not possible. And and there wasn't. And they and they had it in written form. So when the Romans came in, they didn't have take a, take a quick picture. No, they they couldn't do that. I mean, it's it, you know once it's destroyed, it's destroyed. There's no way to get it back. You also see Ezra dealing with this subject. Who's, who's here? From the captivity and, and yeah, if if, if 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 you want to see how Israel struggled with this area, Ezra is a good example because there's some there's some people who were priests who can't who can't serve. Can't prove it. They get they get you know they can't they can't get in there. I mean it's it's kind of a it's kind of a sad story, but I mean if they, if you couldn't prove your descent, you couldn't serve. Yes. Yeah. Um, when I heard the mention about passing things down orally, I thought about the Talmud and how that has diverted from even the Old Testament scripture Judaism. So mm -hmm. isn't the Talmud a good example of what happens once uh, things go oral? Yeah, um, it, it, it is. Um, it is an example of that I mean it's not a it's definitely not a fail safe and and and, and i don't and I don't believe that the the mass the mass of what it would take to pass down the 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 uh the heritage tree or in, a, in an oral way is even possible i mean it's just it's just too too massive a of a of a of a material to even try to pass it down i I have a hard time keeping all my aunts and uncles straight so uh, i mean this <laughs> is, you know, I can barely go back one generation, let alone 50. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so you said today, you know, they were still, the only place they could congregate was the temple. That's, that was the place, that was the largest place that could hold them all. Right. And so since they're not going to the synagogues anymore because they're not doing all the Judaism things, at what point do they start having their own buildings or meeting places the church yes i mean well once the church leaves jerusalem they have to meet somewhere and they're in and the meeting in houses yeah. we don't have any record of when that started happening in jerusalem in, in jerusalem itself well, immediately i mean um when you read acts 2 they're meeting from house to house oh, okay. so uh small groups are yeah smaller that. smaller okay. groups okay. Uh, and of course, some of the houses would have been large, but but even so, it couldn't hold, it couldn't hold the mass of people. So th th they begin meeting house to house right away. Yeah. <clears throat>
Yes. I think there's a question here. Um, so uh, where do where do scribes fall on, on here? Um, scribes could have been priests. Um, they didn't have to be. Uh, they they might be. Uh, we normally associate the scribes with the Pharisees. That's where we normally normally associate them. But uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't have to be priests. But, but they could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ezra was referred to as a Pharisee, a and, a and a priest. priest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's uh, begin our Bible study then. I uh, hope you brought your Bibles with you. <laughs> let's turn to First Thessalonians.